Um, NFL Nation joins the program. Phil, how are you? Good. How's it going, guys? Very doing, well. Phil? Let's first uh, get get an update from Eagles practice today. Uh, so, some injuries out there. Jordan Matthews had that back issue kind of flare up, and also Byron Maxwell with an ankle problem. What can you tell us about number one Matthews and number two Maxwell? Well, um, we don't really watch practice, so all we can get is injury report and kind of talk to the players and, and try to gain from all that you know, some picture of what's going on. Uh, Matthews said yesterday that he would not have been able to play if the game was yesterday. Of course, the game wasn't yesterday. It's Sunday, so it gives him a few days to kind of get things going. Um, he was limited today, so he was out there. He was in uniform. He had a helmet on. Um, so he was doing some stuff, but not uh, not 100%. Um, you know, back injuries are tough. I mean, they're the kind of thing that can uh, they affect everything you do, basically, if you're, if you're trying to move. Uh, and as a wide receiver, you've got to be able to move. Um, I, I wonder a little bit if that was smart to have Matthews play last week. Offensive coordinator Pat Shermer said it was, you know, courageous of him to play. But uh, he only had a couple of catches for, you know, a limited number of yards. And he was really, really obviously affected by the back injury. And uh, he might have been a lot better off this week. You know, going into this Cardinals game, uh, if he, you know, they may be rested for a week, so we'll see how that plays out. Uh, Byron Maxwell, um, he said he twisted his ankle, sprained it uh, on the uh, touchdown pass that Sammy Watkins caught, uh, caught down the sideline. There, uh, he collided with uh, Ed Reynolds, the safety. Um, he said he could barely walk uh, yesterday, so uh, he was out in the field in a, uh, in a sweat sweatsuit. No, not, no helmet, not actually taking part in practice. But he said he thought he, could, he would be able to play by Sunday. So um, that's helpful, obviously, with the Cardinals having the amount of weapons they have a wide receiver. Yeah. But a limited or damaged uh, Byron Maxwell may not be the best thing in the world for the Eagles either. Yeah, and that's my follow-up question, Phil, is would Maxwell be the bigger loss here? Because you are facing Larry Fitzgerald, John Brown, and and Malcolm Flo- and uh, Michael Floyd there. Um, and if Maxwell can't go, it's going to be E.J. Biggers, I guess, on the outside with, with a lot of reps coming for guys like Jalen Watkins and Den, and Den, Denzel Rice, excuse me, would Maxwell be the bigger loss? Yeah, I think so because that that wide receiving you know wide receiving uh, group is is as good as it is uh, you know as there is in the league. Basically, they're top three guys. I mean, Chip Kelly said that too. That they're they're top three wide receivers. They're probably the best group that the Eagles will have faced all season. And the Eagles have had enough trouble um, when there's been you know more than one. Wide receiver. If there's, if there's, the team has two really top top flight wide receivers. It gives the Eagles some problems. It has all year. Um, so yeah, having a team with three of them, and uh, you know the way they move them around, especially, um, it gets complicated because you know Larry Fitzgerald is playing in the slot a lot, which would mean Malcolm Jenkins on him. Um, you know Malcolm Jenkins can handle you know a situation like that to a certain degree, but I don't know if you want to have a steady diet of Larry Fitzgerald. Running with uh, you know Malcolm Malcolm Jenkins is the main guy covering him and no help there. So uh, that could, could could get interesting. I mean, again, you know, if Maxwell plays, you still have the, the you know the chance that he's not 100 percent and he's trying to run on a, on a bad wheel. Uh, you know, with um, you know with John Brown who's a you know, tremendous uh, speed guy, um, that, that could get ugly. But uh, having guys with no experience like Denzel Rice. Or Jalen Watkins, uh, EJ Biggers has some experience, but not not quite that much, and he's certainly not a guy you you want on John Brown. I don't think so. Yeah, that could end up being a, a really big uh, part of this game. Phil Sheridan of ESPN.com joining us here on the Sports Bash. Phil, you had an article here uh, yesterday. I think it went up. DeMarco Murray's role with the Eagles continues to change on ESPN.com. And in there, uh, towards the end on here, you say that uh, the conclusion, Kelly's plan to spread the work among three backs wasn't a bad one. He just may not have the right backs to make it work as effectively as he'd hoped. In, in particular, looking at DeMarco Murray, you highlight in the article how he had the most carries among the backs in the first 10 games of the season, not the case the last two they're paying him a lot of money. Is he a guy who's going to be here and be a part of this running attack next season? I think so uh, for two reasons. One is the uh, football reason, which is, you know, they, they did sign him. They believed that he could you know, be a player in their offense. Um, from a football standpoint, there is a chance. You know, when they signed, there was what we had to talk about, uh, you know, running backs who get over a certain number of carries every year uh, – in any given year, and I think 375 is the number that people point to a lot. But anything up in that range, and, and Murray was over that last year. But a lot of those backs really bounce back the next year very, very well from that. That overuse and the physical pounding that you take 
uh, to play running back in the NFL can wear a guy out, and uh, it takes a while to recover from that. So it may be that you know Murray is just going through that. And, uh, you know, given, a, uh, you know, a, a kind of down year this year could be more effective next year. So I think there's that aspect of it for the Eagles. And, and Chip Kelly will have a year to come say, all right, here's what he's better at. You know, we'll, let's, let's try to tweak the offense a little bit and find some things that DeMarco Murray does well in the offense. Um, and then the other thing is the salary cap. I mean, if you do anything else for them, you know, the, the cap is, is going to be enormous for them. There's going to be a huge amount of dead money on their salary cap. Um, so... You know, there's a business reason and a football reason, and just a pride reason, I guess. Chip Kelly, you know, traded Lashawn McCoy away for uh, a linebacker who's not been as effective as you might have hoped, and the salary cap space assigned to Marco Murray. So um, he's going to try very hard, I think, to get some some return on that investment. Phil Sheridan, ESPN.com, NFL Nation. You also write, Phil, this week uh, a great job in kind of comparing Carson Palmer and Sam Bradford. I mean, when, when you really break the, down these guys and their resumes, they're identical almost. I mean, Heisman trophies, number one overall picks, uh, ACL injuries, they've been traded. Carson Palmer spent time in Oakland. It was a disaster there. But Palmer, uh, on one side of the coin here, he's having an MVP-type season coming off an ACL injury. Sam Bradford, not so much. What has been the major difference in your opinion, Phil, uh, with a guy like Carson Palmer and a guy like Sam Bradford? Yeah, well, I think the main thing uh, at this point, well, there's just there's probably two things. One is that, I mean, Palmer, he is a little bit older, has more experience uh, than Bradford had, uh, and he had, he had more success earlier in his career than Bradford has ever really had. So there was that. He had a little more of a foundation. The other thing is that, you know, uh, Palmer did tear his ACL last year for the second time, um, same one. So that's similar effort, but Bradford had it back-to-back years, and it cost him two years out of football. Came here and just started over, brand new offense, totally new bunch of teammates. Uh, you know, that's a lot of change, to, and to factor in a guy who's coming back from you know tearing his ACL twice, that's a lot for one guy to have to go through in one uh, short stretch of time. Whereas Palmer, he tore the ACL for the second time last year, but he was in his second year. Bruce Arians offense now in his third year um, so he's got a lot more continuity within the offense familiarity with the teammates and all that kind of stuff um, that gives him a little bit of a leg up uh, no pun intended on the leg up thing but it gives him a little bit of a leg up on where Bradford is Phil when you look at uh, some of the comments Chip Kelly made today I know he was asked about all the blitzing that Arizona does and will do on Sunday he also was asked about kind of the way that uh, – or the freedom he gives his quarterback the line to change plays. Against a blitz, you kind of need to be able to do that when you recognize it. In your opinion, has Sam Bradford had that freedom to do that, and how important will that be to do against this Arizona defense on Sunday night? Well, yeah, I think it is pretty important. And, uh, yeah, that was interesting to us because, you know, our general understanding has been that, you know, Kelly calls a play from the sideline, and because they're in a hurry-up offense – um, you know, they don't do what uh, a lot of uh, top quarterbacks do, which is, you know, basically stand there, kind of look over the defense, diagnose what the defense is going to do, and base play calls or audibles on that. I mean, they don't, they're, not, they're not taking that time. So what Kelly does, and this is part of the, part of the uh, overall picture, is Kelly builds the options that the quarterback has, um, you know, to, to make based on the defense. He builds those into the actual play. So a play might have – you know, a run or pass option in it, but instead of audibling everybody on his team to say, okay, we're going to do this instead of that, uh, we're going to run instead of, uh, you know, instead of throw here because of the defensive front. Basically, he gets up to these calls, you know, they all have the same play call, and they all know within the play call that there are, are choices. And it's after the snap of the ball rather than before the snap that the quarterback has to make the decision and make the change. Now that requires everybody being on the same page. Everybody, all you know, all guys on the team, making the recognition that this is the you know, this is the right option in the you know with the defense that we're facing and that kind of thing. So it's a little trickier. Kelly did say that he has the ability to change uh, you know protections or change the play. Um, we had never really heard that before. And with Chip, you never quite know if it's 100 percent what we think is true. <laughs> I mean, what we think of as true. He, he will occasionally twist, uh, twist things a little bit. But it was an interesting conversation because it, this is a team that blitzes a lot. Um, Kelly did say that the team that blitzes second most out of the teams they faced was Buffalo, who they just faced. 
and they did fairly well moving the ball against Buffalo and adjusting to Buffalo's blitzes. So that's a good sign for them. But if they're trying to do the hurry up stuff, um, the other thing with Arizona is that they do a lot of blitzing and they also use a, a lot of personnel in different formations and things like that. That's a lot harder to do during a you know a game where the other team is running a hurry up offense. So the Eagles, you know, try to force defenses to limit what they can do and the adjustments that they can make in terms of personnel and formation by running the up tempo stuff. So it will be an interesting chess match between the Eagles' way of doing things and the Cardinals' way of doing things. They played twice in the last two years. Each team won one game. Uh, they were both close games. So I think it's got a chance to be, you know, a very entertaining game. So kind of a follow-up on that, Phil. It, it, Bradford in the last four games, when you look at that, Bradford is clearly, it, it looks like, been playing much better. He's got a 66% completion percentage, five touchdowns versus one interception. In what you laid out within the, the anatomy of a play for the quarterback, has he just been making better decisions and making better reads within what the defense is doing to get the ball to where it needs to be? Yeah, I think that's a lot of it. I think um, he's just become more comfortable overall. I mean, in terms of every, every every aspect of it, with his own body. I mean, he trusts his legs a little bit more. Um, you know, he's a little more mobile than he had been earlier in the year. He's you know, he's not a, you know afraid or I shouldn't say afraid, but he's not hesitant to uh, take off and move around if he has to. Uh, he's been a, looked a lot more fluid, uh, I think, physically in that way, but also the mental part of it. Um, this year, as we talked to uh, Bruce Arians on a conference call today, and uh, he's gone through this with uh, Carson Palmer and uh, and with other players over the course of his career as a coach. And he said, you know, it takes a little while to, to kind of get your body back to normal, to feel comfortable with what's going on, to learn the offense, to learn all the other players around you. And uh, he, he said from watching film of the Eagles that he really saw Bradford starting to put it together this year uh, as the season was on. So that that is a positive sign. Um, you know, for the Eagles, if, if he can be, you know, we we kind of got a glimpse of what that would look like in that preseason game in Green Bay, where we all thought, okay, maybe this guy's, you know, going to be uh, the real deal. Ten and, for ten, uh, three touchdowns. <laughs> Never forget. Yeah, no, I know, and it was it was you know probably the most uh, the most I've ever fallen for anybody doing it, doing anything <laughs> in the preseason myself because it just seemed like, you know, he really looked like the kind of guy that they talked about, and then when we got to the regular season. It just looked like a whole totally different situation, and I, I think just everything kind of caught up with them. You know, the defenses are more complicated. The defensive players, you know, you're facing all starters, uh, all doing what they do best, and uh, everybody's just a little bit, um, you know, faster paced and all that stuff. And I think you know Bradford just wasn't quite up to that regular game speed yet. Uh, he's gotten there, and he looks better. But uh, you know, this will be the biggest test he's probably had to face in terms of the defense. You know, really, you know, these are one of the least blitz teams in the league this year, generally speaking. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I think one of the reasons is, again, you know, they run that up-tempo stuff, so defenses don't have quite as much time to kind of get organized, get the right personnel in for a situation they want to do. Um, you know, that, that all requires time. You know, disguising a blitz and, you know, bringing a guy from, you know, where he's not expected to come. That's all hard to do when a team's running an up-tempo, hurry-up offense like the Eagles do. So, you know. It, it, it works both ways. There's, a, there's going to be a lot of uh, chess, chess uh, playing going on in this game and all of that happening in, in you know, pretty much uh, record time. Phil Sheridan, ESPN.com, covering the Eagles. You also make the point in, in talking about Ar- Arians and kind of comparing him to, to Chip Kelly. Arians is, is an NFL lifer. I mean, he's worked with Ben, ben Roethlisberger, Carson Palmer, Andrew Luck. It doesn't matter. You know, he, uh, I guess, uses any – any scheme that he can to work with his players. He didn't get rid of any of those Arizona Cardinals guys when he came in there. Of course, he's working with one of the best wide receivers of all time in Larry Fitzgerald. That makes life a lot easier. But when you compare it to Chip Kelly, Chip Kelly kind of hangs his hat like you write in the piece here on his scheme. Do you get the sense, Phil, in the third year here that Chip Kelly really doesn't know what he's doing uh, of uh, as, as far as a, a blueprint goes when talking about getting the right personnel in here? I mean, case in point, DeMarco Murray. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think we'll you know get a better feel um, as this all plays out this year and then see what he does you know, kind of going into next year because, um, you know, they made a lot of changes. And the amount of changes they made, we probably should have expected a little more of an adjustment period for everybody. Um, and simply as I said from the beginning, that he doesn't really, you know, he's himself that he doesn't, um, you know, have a fixed scheme that he, you know, 
especially the quarterback, but in personnel in general, he kind of tailors things, you know, uh, based on what he's got out there. Now, I haven't seen that quite, um, quite as much as you would, uh, you would have thought. I mean, it's quite as much as she describes it anyway. It doesn't look like, doesn't look like that to me as much. But I, you know, he, he doesn't really run the offense that he ran at Oregon, for example. I mean, does not, does not have anybody like Marcus Mariota. And, and, you know, it doesn't look like that offense most of the time. It's, uh, it's very different, uh, in a lot of ways. So he does make adjustments. But, uh, what Bill Davis, the Eagles defensive coordinator, said about Aaron's was interesting because, you know, he basically said, you know, everything he does is based on, what his personnel is, you know, who he has, what they can do, what their strengths are, and, you know, they just gear everything. Um, style of offense, it's, it's all predicated on personnel. Where it seems like Kelly is, you know, um, I mean, he got here and he, he managed to get, you know, career years out of Deshaun Jackson and Jeremy Macklin in back-to-back years, and LaShawn McCoy two great years in a row. And then he just, you know, discarded those guys and brought all these new skill players in. And really, Nothing has really gone quite as well um, this year as they did in the first two years. I mean, he inherited a quarterback, uh, two quarterbacks, and it falls in Mike Vick, uh, wide receivers, running backs. He got a lot more out of the guys that he just inherited and kind of worked around than the guys he actually has brought in himself. And I think that's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if that tells you something about his, his abilities as a scout in terms of you know evaluating talent and assessing how players fit and all that kind of stuff, or just tells you that you know, they just had some pretty good players here and he got the most out of them. I, I know also today, Phil, on the conference call, Arians kind of, first of all, he, he gave a nice shout-out to Temple. We know about his roots with the Owls there. But uh, going back to 2013, he kind of talked about the timeline of, you know, he he had an, uh, uh, an interview scheduled with Philadelphia. I guess they called back and said, you know, we're going to have to cancel this thing. We have Chip Kelly on on the other line. Is that how things kind of went down with Arians? Uh, you know, the possibility of him becoming the Eagles head coach uh, back in 2013, Phil. Yeah, he actually that was a little more than I I had remembered, uh, a little more than I knew at the time, I guess. Because um, Eagles actually, you know, kind of mentioned Arians as a guy that they were going to interview. Uh, came from the Eagles. It wasn't like a uh, a big secret or anything. And uh, he said he went to Chicago to interview with the Bears. That they they put the paperwork in with the league to get permission to interview him first. So he went to Chicago and was talking to them, and really thought he had a shot at that job. And uh, while he was talking to the Bears on that particular day, the Eagles, I think he said the Chargers and the Browns, all uh, notified uh, his agent that you know they were not going to interview him. Um, you know, but they were on you know, on to other candidates or whatever. So. He did not get the Bears job, obviously, and uh, walked out of there with you know three promised interviews disappearing, and uh, did not get the Bears job. He said he was more disappointed at the time about not getting the Bears job because he interviewed for it and he felt pretty good about it. But uh, Arizona has not been the best run organization in the NFL uh, for most of its uh, most of its uh, time in the league. It's just been a you know the Bidwell family's had some problems uh, you know just running a team. But uh, they they got that one right. I mean, you know, it, it'll time will tell whether you know Chip Kelly ends up being a better coach for the long term than Arians. But uh, if you had to hire one of those guys in 2013, um, you know, you could make an argument that that the Cardinals did at least as well or better than getting Arians. He's a he's a really terrific coach and he's been very successful so far. Phil Sheridan of ESPN.com joining us here on the Sports Bash. Phil, wanted to look at the Eagles' defense going up against this uh, pretty well-balanced Arizona Cardinals uh, offense, and particularly Eric Rowe. Uh, We saw him come in in relief of uh, the injured Nolan Carroll against a a great receiver in Megatron, and Billy Davis, for whatever reason, didn't seem like he was going to give him any help out there. You got really good receivers here for Arizona, uh, whether he's lined up against Fitzgerald or the speedster John Brown. Uh, or even, you know, Floyd, how do you think Eric Rowe will do, and do you think Billy Davis will kind of try to give him a little help downfield? Um, there's probably a chance of that. I mean, you know, they're going to have to do uh, some things um, in terms of deep help, if only because, you know, Megatron obviously is a terrific player and is one of the best wide receivers not only now, but ever. <laughs> but, you know, in terms of just sheer breakaway speed, I mean, John Brown may be, you know, as dangerous a guy um, as they face him. No doubt Beckham Jr. is up there, too. But, you know, John Brown is the guy that, 
beat them on a 75 yard touchdown pass here in Arizona. Um, you know, they did, they had two guys you know, trying to run with him and he just ran past both of them. Palmer got on the ball deep and that uh, you know, was a game winning touchdown right there. So, um, I think no matter who's, you know, dealing with, uh, with John Brown or Larry Fitzgerald at the line of scrimmage, um, you're going to have to have some, some serious, uh, serious deep help or it's going to be a really long day for the Eagles. Uh, three games left to go in the season, Phil. Uh, I guess when you look at it, as far as playoff scenarios are concerned, this game against Arizona doesn't mean as much as the one in the week following, obviously, against Washington. Is that really what the win against New England did for this team, Phil, in that it really gave you wiggle room? In, you know, Because this game is a very losable game, let's be honest here, but the, the next week against Washington is really the game, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, it's really strange how the whole thing's worked out. Um, I mean, to me, you know, the, the way they approach things here and, and kind of the way uh, players tend to think and, and just, you know, the general impression of the whole thing, you know, to win this game, you know, it wouldn't necessarily you know, mean as much as beating the uh, NFC East teams they have to face uh, down the line. But, you know, get the 500, win three games in a row going into those final, those final two games against NFC East rivals, um, I mean, all of that. It, it, you know, it'll be a month since you lost a game. All, you know, all the things that kind of go into a player's mindset and a team's sort of you know group uh, personality. I think all of that would benefit from winning this game. Um, now, obviously, the situation in the NFC East is such that it's they don't have to, and because it's going to be a tough game to win, and because Arizona is a really good team, with you know they have, they have their own reasons to want to win. Um, this is important to them too in terms of trying to get you know best possible seating and uh, send off uh, Seattle and the NFC West. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very uh, dangerous game for the Eagles and uh, a game they could well lose. But, you know, it benefits them, you know, not to have that cost in their season. Uh, when you're, you know, 6-7 and seven and um, playing a team that's 11-2 uh, and two, and in Week 15, I mean, that would typically be a recipe for, you know, getting your uh, – postseason hopes dash, but the Eagles are in a very odd situation here where you know they can they can bounce back against Washington at home uh, six days later and uh, turn the whole thing around. But I still think winning the game would go a long way uh, toward just keeping this team uh, on the run that it's been on. Absolutely. Phil Sheridan, ESPN.com, NFL Nation, covering the Eagles. Phil, thanks again. I always appreciate it. Enjoy the game on Sunday. All right. Thanks, guys.